Today, I'm really privileged to be speaking to Judge Ruchi Freya. Before we start the interview, I'd like to share with you this short introductory clip. Rachel Fryer has accomplished many firsts in her life. At 52, the New York judge is, to her knowledge, the first Hasidic Jewish woman in U.S. history to hold public office. She says she didn't accomplish that feat in spite of her faith, but because of it. I happen to be a very religious person. It's my belief in and my faith that really gives me the strength it gives me the backbone that I need. Fryer married at age 19 and says she thought she'd be content to spend her life as a legal secretary. But a decade later, she wanted more. I decided to go to higher education when I was 30. At that point, I had been a legal secretary for many years. And I said, I just can't be a secretary my whole life. And I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try. Because I don't want to be a grandmother in years from now, tell my grandchildren, well, Bobby could have done it. That's the Yiddish word for grandma, but she didn't. I had to try. After law school, Fryer worked in corporate law. In 2016, she ran for office and was elected a New York civil court judge. Soon after, she was assigned to criminal court, an area of law she says she loves. I like to think of myself as a trailblazer, laying down the path and the framework for other people to follow and do something similar. I never consider myself like a ceiling breaker because there's always another obstacle that's, that's, that's in front of me. Always something more to break. Even though Fryer works long hours, she still makes time for what's most important in her life. Her faith, praying three times a day, and her family. A mother of six, she takes care to spend time with her children and her grandchildren, especially over the holidays. Fryer proudly embodies what it means to be a modern career woman yet at the same time says she is very traditional when it comes to her faith. I believe that women are capable. I believe that women have abilities, can achieve a lot. But when it comes to my religion, I embrace the roles of the traditional Jewish woman. My role is being a mother, being there for my children, but it doesn't mean I can't be a professional. And at work, her faith is always nearby. I have the best seat in the house because wherever I sit in this courthouse, above me are the words emblazoned and God we trust. And that always puts me into perspective. Whatever decision I make, there's a God above me. This is the series where we explore what it's like to be a Jew in the workplace in the 21st century. And I can't think of anyone greater to speak to than Judge Ruchi Fryer. How are you keeping Judge Fryer? Baruch Hashem. I am Baruch Hashem, happy to be here, and thank you so much for welcoming me to the St. John's Wood Synagogue. It's wonderful to have you with us. You know, if you were living in London, I'd be having to ask you, as a judge, how do we address you? Is it the right honorable? You know, we've got the Lord Chief Justice, we've got the Master of the Rolls, we've got all sorts of honorable names for judges in England. In the US, mm -hmm. what do you go by when people meet you in the street? Well, my friends call me Ruchi. <laughs> um, people who meet me professionally, they'll call me Judge Fryer. Um, and some people just still call me Mrs. Fryer. So I go by all of them. And some people probably call you Bobby as well, grandma or mommy. Yes, yes, et cetera, that's, et cetera. that's for sure. Well, Absolutely. it's great to meet you and thanks for this opportunity. I guess everyone watching this has, has heard about you because your, your reputation precedes you. But if you could tell us a little bit about who you are, about your life, about your career and what you do, that would be fantastic. Okay, so I like to say I have a profession, not a career, because a career has a connotation that your family is on the back burner. And by me, my family and my Yiddishkeit, my connection to Hashem is at the front burner. And what I happen to do between nine to five on the, on the work days is on the back burner. So I grew up in Borough Park, ultra Orthodox Hasidic home, very humble home. My parents weren't wealthy, weren't connected to any political you know, movement or rabbinical or, or even wealthy. They were just simple people, but very good. And they just imbued on us that concept of you have to work hard and that you have potential. And I went to Beis Yaakov and I was taught by the, t the students of Sarah Shanira, that we were all created, the Tzalem Elohim in the image of God with incredible potential. So my background was that we were here in the world with a mission, imbued with incredible capabilities. And my mother was my best friend, taught us that we can do anything we wanted to do so long as it wasn't illegal, immoral, or against the Torah. So while I grew up in a very ultra orthodox religious home, I never felt constricted. I never felt oppressed. I knew that there were rules I had to follow, but that the world was wide open with opportunity. 
And innate, I was just like the family lawyer. So I was always, you know, advocating for somebody or else in the family. And going to law school was a dream, but it was an impossible dream because back when I was in school, there were no college opportunities for the Hasidic girls, or the boys for that matter. And so I took a course to become a legal secretary in a face tackle of high school. And that's what I became when I was 17 years old. And I married someone who was going to sit in Kolel and learn. And that was my dream to support him. And it wasn't until I turned 30 and being a legal secretary for so many years, I started to work for lawyers that were younger than me. And Rabbi, that didn't sit well with me. I said, I cannot be a secretary my whole life. And that's when things started to change. And that's when my, my innermost dreams and desires started to come forward. And I started college at the age of 30. I had three children at that time. But my, my goal was not to be a rebel, to stay to stay in line with the Hasidic community. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want to compromise our standards. And I prayed a lot to Hashem. I prayed to God to please give me the strength to withstand any challenges because I was warned by many naysayers. And that's the story of my journey. Naysayers, every step of the journey, warning me, Ruchi, you'll never be able to do it. You'll never get into law school. And if you do, you'll never pass the bar. And if you do, you'll never have any clients. So all these never-nevers were always worrying me in the back of my mind. So I, I made a deal with Hashem. Hashem, dear God, if you help me get through law school without compromising my Jewish standards, when your children come to me for help as a lawyer, I will help them. And God wasted no time in testing me. Very shortly after I graduated, I got involved with youth at risk, primarily in the Hasidic community. And then I developed a name for myself as a community advocate. And that's when I got involved with helping a small group of women EMTs who wanted to serve and help other women. And that's how I got involved with Ezra Snashem. And wow. that was this is, a this is project. Just... Rabbi, <laughs> the project of Ezra Snashem, it hit me to the core because here were a group of men who were saying that women weren't capable of being emergency medical responders. So just, just some context for my listeners. Everyone's familiar with the Hatsala organization, which is incredible. You can check out my interview with Ellie Beer, who started Worldwide Hatsala, did some amazing, amazing things um, in United Hatsala. Uh, what uh, what Ruchi has, has set up, if I may call you Judge Fryer, has set up yes. is an organization called Ezra Snoshim, which is basically a Hatsala service just for women. Is that correct? Yes, and I need to make the distinction because you're speaking to your listeners in, in, you know, in England. United Hatzalah of Israel has no connection to Hatzalah here in America, here in New right. York. Eli Beer does have women in his organization for many years and even integrated Haredi women when I start to speak out about Ezra Snashim, I was invited here to speak to the women over there. Here in New York, we have a complete different set of dynamics. Hatzalah is a wonderful organization, been around for almost 50 years. When it was first formed, there was supposed to be a women's division. Those women are now in their 70s, and they were supposed to serve. After the first trial run, they were told it's not sneeze, it's not modest, women and men cannot serve together. Ever since then, women wanted to join to serve other women, but I never knew about it. And most of the women here did not know about it. It was kept under the carpet. They were silenced. They were suppressed. And then when they first came to me to help them, I thought, this is a slam dunk. This is the 21st century. This is America. We have a constitution. You can't do this to women. Hatella will surely take them in. And I confronted opposition. And I realized that I wasn't going to fight. If you can't join him, then beat him. And then I said, we're going to start our own organization, which is what the men there told us to do, thinking it will never happen again people telling me it's never going to happen. But you know what happens, Rabbi, when you tell me I can't do something? Worst thing to do. Worst thing. The, those <laughs> men pressed the wrong buttons. They provoked me because they said that Jewish women weren't strong enough, fast enough, or smart enough. And I don't believe that's what God's Torah says. Wow. You know, it's an unbelievable thing. You, you mentioned at the beginning that you grew up in the Beis Yaakov system. You, you, you mentioned Sora Schneer. I would say that you are the Star Schneer of the 21st century. You are really breaking all the stereotypes. You're a female judge, a Hasidic woman who's got a tremendous career and work life. You've started this unbelievable organization. Would you say you're the 21st century Sora Schneer? I, 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 I don't think I can actually agree to that. But if, if someone says it about me, this is like the highest honor you can attribute to me. And in fact, she is my role model. 
And, and you know something, I went to school being taught by her students. They, we never learned in school that she was considered controversial. I only found out about that years later when I read a book about her life. And I realized that she's my role model when I read one of the chapters in that book. And she taught her students that a Jewish daughter must always wear a dress with two pockets. And in one pocket, you carry the verse from Psalms, the Pasuk from Tehillim, Kokuda Bas Nima, that your modesty is your badge of pride. Daughters, you wear it in your heart with your head up high. But King David says, in your other pocket, Sarah says, you wear carry the verse, there comes a time when it's a time to act in Eslasos. And you girls will be leaders and people will follow you. And she trained young, single Polish Jewish girls to be teachers. And she sent them to the far flung shtetl. This was in the 1920s. Yes, that was revolutionary. And she changed the face of Jewish women because now for the first time we have a Jewish education. So that's my role model because people will ask me, Yuki, how can you reconcile being Hasidic and having such a public persona? Maybe it's not modest. And Sarah Schneer's teachings is what is, is the ticket for me to, to go on, that yes, you can be Hasidic and you can be proud and you can be devout and you can still be a leader in your own right. It's an interesting thing. You know, a lot, a lot of the, the members in my community have a certain view in their minds of what a Hasidic woman looks like, what she does, how she lives her life. And I guess seeing this will really break all the molds. I know there was recently a, a television series called Unorthodox. I haven't seen it myself, but I know a lot of people have been talking about this series, that it's kind of put the Hasidic community in a certain box and category. I don't know if you're familiar with this. You could perhaps share with us what's your insight into the Unorthodox TV series. Yeah, I have a lot to share. It's interesting. Well, I'm the subject of a documentary film called 93 Queen. And the reason why I did that 93 was because when Queen. Yes, that's, that's the name of the film, 93 Queen. And it's available, um, if, my, if, my, if people watching this want to see 93 Queen, where can they see that? I think it's on Amazon. I think it's on okay. PBS. So it's on the internet out there, okay. available to the public. So the filmmaker had approached me when, she, when we first started to get publicity about Ezra Snashim. And she said to me, Ruchi, let me do this documentary. And I said, no, because we're Hasidim. We don't even go to the movies, let alone be the subject of a movie. And she said, but there's such a negative stereotype about Hasidim. And if you let me follow you, I will we'll debunk that theory. And I said, no, I don't want to do that because the risk is too great. And then she said, but Ruchi, if you do, it will be a Kiddush Hashem, a sanctification of God's name. And that's when I agreed to do it. But 93 Queen actually follows me, my family, and my fellow volunteers for five years. You come into our home, you see our life. Now, I, I saw the film on Orthodox because I, I was forced to. I wasn't looking to watch it for entertainment. But when a good friend of mine called me up, and he's not from the community, and called me up, he says to me, Rookie, you know, you always tell me about your life, and it always seems so beautiful. So I watched this film, and my wife and I were very disappointed. We, we don't know. It doesn't look like what you've described. So I said to him, Michael, if you could just encapsulate in one sentence, what bothers you the most? He says, well, after seeing that film, the big question we have is, are all Jewish marriages loveless? And I said, no, not only is our, our, our marriage is full of love, but our whole life is imbued with simcha, with joy and happiness and love and commitment to God and his Torah. We have values, we have ideals. We don't just wake up in the morning and think, hey, who am I, where am I going? We have a life that's set with values and I, when I was talking, I explained to him, I said, you know something, I have to watch this film myself. And I feel that the film is an injustice to our society. I think that it, you, if you want to call it entertainment, call it entertainment. It's not an accurate portrayal of our community, of our life, not of anyone who I know. It happens to be a good plot. It happens to be a film with great actors. But those actors could have been wearing any kind of hats. I don't know why they had to wear the strimals because it was a complete inaccurate view of the characters, of the community, and how we practice religion. It's so fascinating just talking to you. I'm, I'm interested that you, you talk about, about love, marriage, relationships. Tell me about your family, like in terms of how do they connect with all of this and how it must kind of not stigmatize them, but you know, they walk around, they're, they're ruchi free as a husband and children and grandchildren. In the Hasidic world, that must be challenging for them, or perhaps they wear it as a badge of honor. How, how does it work for them? Excellent question, because my, my story, my journey is one of 30 years. I tried to share it in 30 minutes is always a challenge. But in the beginning years, in the early years, when I started to travel on my journey, it was hard. 
It was hard for my husband. It was hard for my children. They were always asked, like, why is your mother doing this? Why, how could you let your wife do this? My husband was asked. And he would say, she doesn't ask me. But I knew that I was doing nothing wrong. I knew that there was no role model, but I said, God is giving me this inspiration to go on this path. It doesn't just happen by coincidence. And, you know, in the documentary film, you hear me saying, it would have been so much easier if God created me as a man with these ambitions, but God doesn't make any mistakes. And if God created me as a woman with these aspirations, that means there's a reason for it. And I just kept on going and going because I just couldn't stop. And I said, if I hit a brick wall and I feel that I'm doing something that's not right, I will stop. And I, and I would see Hashkacha Pratis, divine providence, every step of the way connecting the dots. And I can tell you, the organization of Ezra Snashem has been based on miracles. In fact, we were just given the authority to purchase an ambulance last week. It came rolling down the streets of Varapak. Rabbi, that was nothing short of a miracle. I can't tell you how many men would have snickered. You ladies can never drive an ambulance. Guess what? We are. Wow. If God wants something to Is happen. Is it challenging? I mean, there's Ezra Snoshim, this women's ambulance. Like, in terms of um, the challenge that presents, three o'clock in the morning, as, you, as I think you, you mentioned this, I think I may have seen you speaking about this elsewhere. The idea, three o'clock in the morning, women to come, forced flights of stairs, no, no elevator in the building. And you, how do you challenge? How, how, how does it work practically? Are there any practical challenges that a group of women face that perhaps a group of men might find easier? Or does just that a stereotype as well? I think it's a stereotype because in the world of emergency medicine out here in New York, 50% of the EMS providers are female. So it's only in the ultra orthodox community where Hatsala has basically had a monopoly on emergency responders, where they said only men could do it. And that's wrong. And aside from that, Rabbi, it goes against what's in the Torah. Because in the Torah, correct me if I'm wrong, even in the Hevra Kadisha, right? When they're doing a tahara on a, on, a, on a mace, on a corpse, it's men for men and women for women, right? That's that sensitivity. And what I've heard is that if there's no man available to do the tahara for a man, a female is allowed to do it, but not vice versa. A woman cannot be done by a man. That's the sensitivity of the tzniyas for women. So how has it been that a group of men, maybe 10 of them, have decided that all those halachas don't apply because men are more capable? If that's the case, then why isn't every lifeguard in every girl's summer camp a man? If men are faster, stronger, and smarter, as they told me, then every Hasidish girl's camp should have a male lifeguard. But we don't because we know it's not true. Can we talk a little bit for, for a few minutes we have remaining? about your career. So you are a, an elected judge in New York. Tell us what's a day in the life of, of your work life like? Tell us about that. And uh, it must be very exciting. Yeah. So it actually is. It's also very humbling. It's very humbling because to be in a position where you can make a decision that could really have an impact on someone's life. So it also depends which court I'm assigned to. When I first sat on the bench, I was assigned to criminal court for the first two years. And then I was assigned to civil court. Now, the civil court cases are more where people are suing each other. There could be a car accident. There could be um, insurance companies don't want to cover certain medical fees. So those are the cases I'm sitting and listening to right now. The first two years I sat in criminal court, and those were the kind of cases that really made me think, oh, wow, you know, Shivisi Hashem Negdi Summit, God is always in front of me because the decisions I make, a human being is not capable of doing this on my own. And I always say, Rabbi, that I have the best seat in the house because in the New York courts, every courtroom has, wherever the judge is sitting above me are the words, in God we trust, like you see on the American dollar bill. And if anybody questions my decision, I'll point and I'll say, God is watching me. Wow. And that's the, only, that's the only thing that I have to worry about. If I wouldn't have that faith in God, it would be difficult and challenging to make these decisions, but I believe- to what, extent, to what extent does the Torah and, and your Jewish upbringing and your Hasidic kind of moral standing affect the decisions that you make or does it not come into it? So it's and, interesting and, because- And are there any conflicts from time to time? So it's a great question. Every, every person is a product of their environment. Every person, no matter if you're an atheist, or if you're religious, whatever religion you practice, you are a product of your environment. You come to the bench with your mind that has been conditioned and formed based on your upbringing. Nobody comes 
as a robot, that empty box. We're all thinking human beings. And the idea is that we need to understand that every person that comes has a value system. And what I find so amazing, which I found very amazing when I was studying constitutional law in law school, so much of the law is based on the Torah law. And we know that that is the first set of laws ever given to mankind. And when you go into the New York State Supreme Court building, there's an engraving of Moshe Rabbeinu holding the luchos. When you go to the Queens County State Supreme Court, you have a beautiful painting. On the one side, you see the founding fathers writing the Constitution. And the other wall, you have a beautiful painting of Moses holding the Ten, Com Ten Commandments. And it's an interesting painting because it must be by somebody who actually studied the Torah. Because on that painting, the, the luchos are square. No not McDonald's usable signs. round ones. No, exactly. <laughs> so we're, in the courthouse itself, you see the image of Moshe Rabbeinu. So what do I have to say? I'm telling you what you just see. But the, the, the values of the Torah, the Torah values, those Judaic values of chesed, emes, tzedek, mishpat, those are the, those are the fundamental concepts that you judge anybody by. And then you have the Mishnah telling you, judges, be deliberate in your judgment. Don't be hasty. Put yourself in the shoes of the other person. So those are the concepts that every Jewish child is raised with. So for me, going up to the next level is just a natural progression of my background. And in terms of a conflict that you asked, I have never experienced a conflict. But if there is a conflict that you feel that something in your, in your belief, in your value system cannot allow you to judge fairly or unbiased, then you, you accuse yourself. You have an obligation right. to recuse yourself. Wow. This is just so fascinating and so interesting. You know, looking back at your career, if you could do it all again, and you're starting at the beginning, and you're a teenager in Beis Yaakov, and you're thinking about your future and your trajectory, what would you do differently? That's an amazing question. Um, I, I, I'm very grateful, and I know that I did everything that I could have done in the age that I was born in. Now with my children, I told them, don't wait until you're 30 to go to college. My daughter started at a much younger age. So I think I, I think I took advantage of any opportunity that came my way. The only thing that I would have changed is I've learned that not every position is always gonna work out. You may be a secretary, you may be a supervisor, you'll have different jobs. And sometimes when you find yourself that you're in an environment that is just not working out, don't waste too much time trying to make it work. Move on. Daven and pray to Hashem to give you that hashgacha practice, that divine providence, that divine guidance. But sometimes it's just not meant to work out. And just realize that gamzula tova, this is also for the best. And some point in the future, you're going to realize that it, this is the way it was meant to be. Wow. Judge Ruchi Fry, this has been an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I wish you ongoing success. And please God, one day soon, hopefully not in a courtroom, but hopefully we'll get to meet face to face. Yes, I so want to just end off. I'll just end off with one little lesson that I wanted, I'd like to share with your listeners is that people don't understand the amount of potential that they have. We underestimate the potential. We were created with Selim Elul Kim. You have so much potential. So I'd like to end off with a small little story an old Hasidic story of Reb Zisha. Reb Zisha was one of the original Hasidic rabbis, a, you know, a student of the Baal Shem Tov, and he was on his deathbed and he's crying. And his students are asking him, Rabbi, you're such a holy man, why are you crying? You're surely gonna go to Gan Eden. Reb Zisha says, I'm not crying because up in heaven they're gonna ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like Moses? And I'm not crying because they're gonna ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like King David? I'm crying because they're gonna ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like Zisha could have been? We don't know what we can accomplish. I had so many naysayers every step of the way telling me it couldn't happen. It's impossible. Anyone out there who has a dream, stay committed to your Jewish values. You don't have to compromise them and you can still be successful. Dream, work hard, and be successful. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great day. My pleasure.